We are back on It's Always Game Day in Cincinnati. Lindsey Patterson, Mike Santagata. Mike, what's up? Well, uh, today is the day for me where Spider-Man 2 comes out. So I'm excited. Um, as of recording, I have a little under five hours. So that's what I'm waiting for. Um, other than that, you know, my fiance is great with like, she knows that this is kind of like a side job and like, Hey, we don't, we don't schedule anything on Sundays except the bye week type thing. But, you know, Spider-Man week doesn't really feel like a bye week, but then she scheduled, I have engagement photos Saturday and I'm meeting with friends Sunday and I'm just like, Oh no, my bye weekend. It's, going it's over. Away. Your bye weekend is over. You have plans. This is what happens because I was just thinking that how many people will be going to the pumpkin patch on Saturday or Sunday because there's no Bengals game on Sunday. You go do your activities. You have things that were planned that you can knock out because it's no longer bye week. And I know you had other plans, but unfortunately, that's going to that's how it works. Yeah, uh, luckily I'm not in the Cincinnati. Well, we're not going to a pumpkin patch. We bought some Walmart pumpkins, so that'll that'll be the pumpkins that I possibly carve. I how do you feel about carving pumpkins? I don't want to do it. I don't love it. Like it's gross. <laughs> Why are you doing it? Why are you I doing don't it? even care. I just like scooping it out. And if the pumpkin came to me, mm-hmm. just carved out, and like I just gotta carve it myself. Love it. That's great. That's fine. It's the process to get there that I don't like. I would rather paint the pumpkin than carve it. I think that would be fun. I, I, you, you, like you said, you have to get all the stuff out. The pumpkin's good for like one night to put a little candle in it and say, Oh, look what the pumpkin I carved. It's, it's, I don't like to do it. And if you like to carve pumpkins, I'm sorry, this is a non carving pumpkin podcast. Um, but do it during your bye week, but it's bye week. You know what happens during bye week? All kinds of different scenarios. There's a lot right now. And I, f- I feel like if you were on Twitter today or even the last 24 to 48 hours, you would see all the different trade scenarios. Because the deadline is on Halloween, speaking of pumpkins. And it'll be here before you know it. Two, everybody is, has these scenarios of a tight end or maybe they can trade for a running back. And I will say that I, I had mentioned the P. Ryan thing a couple of podcast episodes ago. I was kind of saying it like. I was kind of joking about it. I don't think that they're going to do anything when it comes to the trade deadline, reaching out to another team. Look, I'll be surprised if they do, but I don't think any of that stuff's going to happen. How do you feel about all that stuff right now? Uh, what are the odds they actually make a trade, do you think? 5%. Okay. Just enough to not be scientifically mm-hmm. significant. That was uh... – <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> that was always the, the rule. I was a science major. Those are the rules that had to be under 5%. So just outside of that, like we don't, you know, like it could happen. <laughs> yeah, there's a chance. That, I mean, they've done other things. They've changed their ways over the last couple of years. But when it comes to the middle of the season trading, you just don't see it. I know the Carlos Dunlap one, but I feel like that's a bad example. Oh, yeah. Um, and this would be trading to acquire. I don't think they're going to trade anybody away. No. But I mean, I feel like there are. I don't know. Would you rather trade for a backup running back or a starting tight end? A running back. Oh, I am the opposite. Really? Yeah. Yeah. I just, I feel like the backup running back matters, of course, but the starting tight ends on the field all the time. So <laughs> I feel like it might be more important. I mean, I have some gross names <laughs> we could throw out. Go ahead, throw them out. I don't think it's going to be anything exciting. Okay, so like the one I think everybody's going to want is Mike Gesicki. Look, I think they're – howdy, Gesicki family. There's a reason that this man has never been the start. Like he he had the two 700-yard years. Back-to-back years, he is benched for tight ends that aren't as physically gifted as him. He doesn't block. He's basically a receiver. Great. And I guess the Bengals have – a tight end that can block and they don't use them. So maybe they really just do need a, a big receiver. But I don't know. I just, I don't, I don't think I see him in the same light as a lot of fans, but okay. <laughs> back keep, to back. Keep it going. Nearly, it sounds great. <laughs> nearly the same age. Hunter Henry and Austin Hooper. I feel like 
they're competent. That could, I feel like that could get you a Hayden Hurst type tight end. That's what I was going to say. I feel like that could get Hunter paid at the end of the season. Not, yeah. Nothing crazy, but a nice little chunk for a tight end player on another team. Yeah, yeah. Dalton Schultz is there. He signed a one-year deal with Houston, so I guess that's a possibility. Um, but I don't know what Dalton Schultz market is for anything. Or if Houston wants to give him because he signed the one-year deal there. And then the other guy I was looking at, when I'm just looking at the guys are in contract years, would be Gerald Everett, although he is no longer like the young fun. He is 29 years old, and he was kind of disappointing in L.A. And I do feel like if the Bengals wanted him, they would have gone after him his free agency year and not, you know, it kind of Josh Reynolds feeling, although Reynolds doing great in Detroit. So maybe yes. you know, shouldn't just trust that Zach knows, <laughs> but he was with him. So he knows Zach and he knows at least Zach's terminology and playbook. Maybe not this system, maybe not all the plays, but that one, I guess also, if you're going to look at tight ends possibility, but yeah, nothing, nothing like that exciting. And it, th that also fits the Bengals. Cause I don't think the Bengals are going to try to do anything that exciting at the deadline. It's almost unfortunate that the Jets are three and three right now because I feel like if they would have lost even this past weekend, they'd be two and four, or even if they only had one win, they could be looking at a season where obviously Aaron Rodgers, I don't see him returning. I know there's some people out there that think he's going to end up returning from his Achilles injury this year. That would be crazy. Um, but they have quite a few tight ends on their roster. Um, and that could could have been a team that could be looking at trading, but now they're three and three. There's still hope for their season. Um, so I don't, I just, I don't see it happening. The Hayden Hurst thing that I'm seeing today, the Cincinnati Bengals do not want to pick up that contract. Well, yeah. I mean, I don't even know if it's that, but it's multiple years. Like they don't want to add a multi-year expensive deal. That's why I'm looking at guys in contract. Like this is it. Yeah. Like, you get this deal, you get paid somewhere else. Kind of like what they thought with Irv, even if Irv hasn't worked out. And that's why I went to running backs real quick to try to see if I see names that There's make not. sense in the grand scheme of things. And um, injuries noted. But Rashad Penny's like a healthy scratch in Philly. I don't know. It feels He's got juice. So here's my thing, because... I, I know, I feel like I've said this plenty of times on here. I don't think the Cincinnati Bengals utilize the tight end position, but do I think the tight end position could help their offense right now? 100%. They're last in the NFL. Anything could help their offense. Um, but for me personally, I still want to see a run game. And I want to believe I want to believe in Chase Brown. Oh, yeah. Well, that's why I brought Rashad Penny was I wanted to talk about maybe yeah. a couple backup running backs. Now. Give, me, give yeah. me some more backup running backs. Yeah, yeah. Penny's cool, though. I mean, he averaged over six yards a carry in 21 and 22. This year, he's only had three carries, and he's averaging three yards an attempt. But I don't know. Maybe the injuries have taken their toll. Maybe they haven't. But I feel like that's something that they don't have is somebody that's exciting and can break off a run like that. Like, I've seen people float around Cordero Patterson. Do you know how old Cordero Patterson is? I thought he – he. I have no clue. I didn't even know he was still in the league, to be completely honest with you. Yeah, he's 32, and he's averaging five snaps a game for Atlanta. I, I feel like people have an idea of Cordell Patterson. That is not what he currently is. And I'm also just going to ignore, like, any running backs. that's like Austin Eckler, Derrick Henry, Tony Putt. Like, those guys, that, they're, not, not they're not after that. <laughs> I can't yeah. – It's – that's the problem. I mean, if a guy was – if a guy was – capable yeah. of adding to your running back room, he'd probably already be on a team right now. Um, and I just, I don't see them trading for one, the only one. And like I said, it makes sense to me. And I know how a lot of people feel. Cause I feel like he's running back number three on Denver when it comes to P Ryan, it's oh, just because he's familiar. It's just cause he's familiar with it. And it just feels like something, if they were to trade, they would go to something they know. I'm looking up his, I mean, I guess it's only a two year deal and you can get out of it this year. Or uh, next year, I mean, with they one point five. The same yeah. thing, the same thing Denver did. Yeah, yeah, I, they're probably willing, but man, I think I'd rather go for a Rashad Penny just because I want something different in the backfield. I want something okay. with juice, not just ah, cool. P Ryan's back, and then 
it's probably good. And you, like your offense will, the success rate and staying on schedule, that'll all be there. But P Ryan, he doesn't give you explosive runs. Similar to mix and race now he's not giving you explosive runs even if he can keep you on schedule so to me i'd rather go for a guy that can okay you know like hand him the ball and he might just break something off which is something none of the running backs have done this year like mixon's the closest and he's also the guy that keeps him on schedule and he's the only guy getting carries anyway so he's the only one that has a chance so they don't trust any of these other players yeah when you look at who some of these teams were signing off the street to uh play running back after these injuries like Damian Williams he's back uh, he, he played snaps for Arizona that uh the Lombardi Lenny uh oh my goodness in. what is his market Royce Freeman off the street <laughs> well you saw that report earlier it was kind of like an agent probably put it out like Lenny's gonna go the bills have interest and him, he's going to come work out. And then all of a sudden, one of the NFL Network reporters said on Monday morning, this is not happening. He is not going. He's getting a lot of interest, but it's not in Buffalo. No, I can't. Lenny doesn't give you what I'm looking for either. No, like, no, no. His no, athleticism is no. kind of zapped too. Like I, what I would be looking for is either – is probably something exciting. I guess Daryl Henderson could have fit that, but the, he just signed to the Rams again. And that's another one that's like Zach, I think, is familiar with him. I think mm -hmm. they cross paths in L.A. And there's probably a reason he's not interested. That's <laughs> just usually how that goes. But at the same time, you look at Josh Reynolds. He's succeeding. He's thriving in Detroit. And Zach was never interested in him, even as a wide receiver for. It felt like there was always a rumor that Cincinnati had interest in him for like two years. And yeah, there'd be like rumors, but then he'd sign like a vet men deal. And mm -hmm. it's like if he was if we were if the Bengals were actually interested, he would have been probably, signed. Probably yeah. would be in Cincinnati. So it doesn't really sound encouraging when you bring up all these names and the people. So I I, I just want people to realize there are a couple things here. I don't see it happening. Um, there are things that the Cincinnati Bengals front office, they've changed over the last few years. I just don't see this happening. They really value their draft picks and they want to hit on those draft picks because they have some big contracts continuing to come up, even going into next year. So I truly feel like they are going to be very content, but that doesn't mean that it's okay. You still need to get more out of your guys. We, we said it on the last podcast. Brian Callahan said, everyone but Jamar Chase needs to step up on offense. That's your quarterback and Joe Burrow. He needs to play better. You look at, you know, the rest of your wide receiver room, your running back room, and Joe Mixon, and maybe they involve Chase Brown more in the second half of the season. And, and we saw a little bit of Chase Brown in the last game, very minimal Chase Brown. But I think that you got to see what he is. You draft him for a reason, fifth round. I think they feel he could be running back number two. I want to see more out of him. I do too, but then I always think of the Mike Zimmer quote with Kellen Mond where a reporter asks, like, don't you want to see more Kellen Mond? And he said, not particularly. I see him every day in practice. <laughs> Zach Taylor definitely. No, no, no offense. This is not a, a bash on Zach Taylor, but look, he has the wide receivers. Joe Burrow wants to throw the ball, so they don't they don't really want to run the ball at all. Uh, but you have to run the ball. You you have to be able to run the ball. It's just there's no way about it towards the second half of the season. Um, and you know, this isn't about Joe Mixon. Cause I do, I, I did feel encouraged by him early in the season, but mm -hmm. you still need, you still need that second running back. You really, yeah, you, need, you need to make it. So Mixon doesn't wear down in the next couple of weeks. I mean, that's the biggest thing to me personally is just, I want to see him make it to the end of the year and still have all this juice. And to do that, instead of him taking 20 touches a week or something, he's at 15 and somebody else is able to take six I like I feel like I'm not asking for that much like six seven touches from a different running back per Which game make it Travion one play make it Chase Brown one play you know yeah just, we say this and then it's like, yeah, it but they're not doing it so like do they need somebody else but then who's out there and then that becomes a whole thing is like have they just kind of like made their bed and they might have to imagine mix it out like that's the biggest thing to me is like if Mixon was out what do they do because it feels like they just they would probably have to roll. Chase. Yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> you know, he's in the backfield sometimes. Every every ball is going to Jamar Chase at that point. Uh, no, it, it's it's scary when you look at your running back room, and that's why I'm I keep thinking about RB two, and I hope there's a plan because you have three running backs on your roster. 
or you have three, you have Travion, you have Chase Brown and you have Chris Evans. So outside of Joe Mixon, what are you doing? I just, I just want to know what the plan is there because it really doesn't feel like there is one right now. Maybe that'll change. And maybe Brian Callahan and Zach Taylor at Paycor stadium right now. And they're coming up with ways to use one of their running backs, but I don't know. We'll see what it looks like uh, when it comes to tight end. I want to wrap this up and then we'll get to some of the questions. Herb Smith. It really doesn't feel like Joe is trusting Herb Smith right now. Yeah. Uh, he's just such a weird tight end. I mean, I guess Burrow dealt with Thaddeus Moss in at LSU who had a similar body type and was less athletic, but you know, like tight ends under like six foot four, kind of a rarity and he's six foot two um i also think he you know like he did have the injury that kept him out a couple weeks so yeah he's uh i don't know it does feel like i mean yeah i i guess i would say it feels like he doesn't really trust him but what did Hayden Hurst do all the time was work underneath and be dependable for contested catch situations and be an okay, adequate level blocker, like just solid across the board type of player. And Irv hasn't given you that either in the run or the pass game. So there's time and maybe they can develop some chemistry because, you know, Burrow did miss all training camp and then Irv missed some weeks where Burrow was healthy now, but when I, and maybe just Burrow gets better and it works. I don't know, but right now it doesn't feel good. And that's why if I was looking at people are like, I'm just kind of looking at bringing in some competent level time. I'm not looking to bring in something exciting because Irv kind of was that something exciting. You think of all the, I was down on his projection comparatively, but it felt like everybody was saying like, oh, this guy's going to do better than Hurst as a receiver. I did. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you weren't the only one. Like I wasn't I trying to call you out. I need, like, to, I need to call myself out for that because I did. And I, I've a been people, wrong. Though. A lot of people were thinking like, oh, this guy's going to be great. Like, you know, he can move, he can do all this other stuff and then it doesn't happen. So then I'm just thinking like you bring in a Mike Kosicki, it could be the same thing where they don't trust him as a blocker. Then they have to try to get him on the field and use him creatively and do all this other stuff. And then he drops a few balls because he's done that and he doesn't run his routes well. <laughs> so he doesn't keep himself clean on his releases, but. Yeah, that doesn't uh, sound great, honestly. The, he's a big just, target that can catch the ball, uh, make yeah. contested catch. He can do contested catches better than Irv. I think That's that great. for sure. And he probably has better straight line athleticism. But from when, from what I watched like a few years ago at this point, it doesn't seem like he like throttles down or keeps his body clean on the release very well. So he kind of has to make those contested catches because he's not getting separation. He's just able to be a downfield threat and make circus catches, which is fine. But I feel like that also could lead to, you know, you have to have a lot of trust to put that many passes up to your tight end in with a defender draped on them. Um, not that I think that somebody like Austin Hooper or Hunter Henry is really some dominant force waiting to be unleashed. I just feel like they bring a level of competency, both of them and, as a blocker and as a tight end in the receiving game. Like they're probably not doing much in man coverage, but against zone, they're both smart enough and experienced to sit down, know the voids, work with the quarterback. And we're doing all this and they're not going to make any trades, but that's, I would be after competency at tight end and excitement at running back, not the other way around. I say all this and I'm just happy it's content while we get to the end of bye week to be completely honest with you. We have um, really one more podcast episode until we can start previewing the 49ers and the Cincinnati Bengals, but uh, it's bye week. So anybody's going to come up with, with all these trade scenarios and we only have a little over a week and then it'll all be over because I don't see any of that happening. But we move on to your Twitter questions. Thank you as always for sending them. Make sure you follow along Bengals underscore Sand. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson. Let's go ahead and see. Will we see any under center play action plays now that Joe Burrow is healthy? So it sounded like in the Locked On Bengals interview with Brian Callahan, which everybody should listen to. It was good. Yeah, it sounded like they're going to try to possibly implement more under center. To me, it just feels like recency bias with how much people are talking about this because I remember last year and why they scrapped everything this was not a shotgun only offense in week one week two 
week three last year, and it wasn't a shotgun only offense two years ago. That started because of how bad the under center game was going for them. So that makes me question, like, I know this on paper, you know, turning your back to the defense, giving a hard fake, et cetera, is supposed to help. Burrow's not really that comfortable doing that. He's not. He never really has been. That's why I thought pistol might make sense. Um, but we'll see. I'm much more cautious about how this is going to work than it feels like other people who think like this is the easiest solution in the history of the world. The Bengals need to go under center. It's like, in theory, in theory, I hear you. We but saw you it. Joe Burrow's career when you say that. Like, it just doesn't. It doesn't work. This doesn't. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean it, yeah, it just hasn't worked. I mean, to me still, I think the offense will be fine. And everything basically comes down to if the quarterback can play at a high level, like he did last year and the year before, if he yeah. can't, maybe you have to figure out how to work some type of weird under center thing so that you can get those freebies and those cheap plays off of it. But when I'm, Looking at it now, I feel like the best offense the Bengals are going to have is when they go shotgun. I agree. And and before we get to more Twitter questions, when you were listening to the Brian Callahan interview, I think both parts are up now over on Locked On. Mm -hmm. It's really a good listen. Uh, one of the things we say about Brian Callahan, he's very honest in his interviews. And I think a lot of people can appreciate that, not only as Bengals fans, but people have an interest in the team and the offensive struggles. And when the offense has success, was there anything else that you, you know, you took away from that interview? Um. I mean, yeah, uh, I like hearing some of like his thoughts on a lot of different things. Oh, man, I think the biggest one that I know, but people need to hear everybody in the NFL on offense and defense, but on offense is running. They're all running the same plays. Mike McDaniel is not drawing up plays on the back of a Wendy's napkin every week that nobody has ever seen before. And he talked about that. He basically said, like, we're all running the same plays. It's that's that's to me also what like the execution of things is kind of more important than anything else. But you know, the frequency in which you call different things and when you call them into what defenses, etc. This all matters and how you dress up the plays matters a lot. But people get so crazy about when they see a wide receiver open, like, ah, Zach never does that. It's like, well, the Bengals could run that concept and they just like most of the time you see a guy W A O, you know, wide butt open <laughs> in, on the in the field is because somebody busted the coverage. Like that's usually the reason. It's not because that was drawn up and whatever else. Maybe they stress the communication and maybe you want Zach Taylor to do that more often. But yeah, I, I I don't know. Like they're all dressing up and running the same plays. I think people need to re like remember that. And I think you could even um, I want to say you had the clip on social media, the one where it looked like Irv Smith was wide open for a touchdown, and it just didn't work out. And Joe he either got oh, that's Kyle Kasky. Kyle Kasky, sorry, Kyle Kasky. Um, he was the one, but the one where you know Irv was wide open, and it just and that would have been a good play call by Zach Taylor. But the players have to make it happen too. Exactly, and you know it's funny is the Seahawks ran that same exact concept and Gino missed it. See, proving Brian Callahan's point. You're, you're <laughs> They're all running the same plays. plays. Could you little... imagine the Seahawks hit that and, you know, Bengals Twitter blows up like, Zach never calls anything like that. <laughs> That's like, well, he did earlier in the game. They just, they gave up pressure on it. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure a lot of Joe Burrow in the second half, he would want a lot of those, those balls back or decisions he made because – that was pretty much on Joe Burrow, the majority of, of the second half struggles. And we've said it before, when Joe Burrow struggles, this often struggles. And that's just really what we saw. So I do, I have a lot of confidence in the world that, you know, he'll be able to bounce back. I, you know, it feels like you're at the finish line of almost being at 100%, if not at 100% by the bye week that his calf is feeling that way. Don't think the calf is an issue, obviously, because uh, we saw the Arizona game. But, you know, hopefully the bye week is just a good clear your head get the offense rolling and maybe there's some changes offensively um, on, on what they decide to do. Another Twitter question. What run plays will we see against the 49ers? Tight zone and duo for sure. Those are their core plays. The 49ers, 
play what's called an even front, so four down. And this is like what Marvin Lewis used to do and with Mike Zimmer um, for their, you know, most of their stuff. They really kind of, it's not, it's not the Jim Schwartz defense, but it's closer to that than it is like uh, what the Steelers do or, you know, they want to get up field and they want to rush and they want to rush the passer, but they want to get penetration because penetration can kill run plays. So I wouldn't be shocked if this is a game they attempt a trap. Um, I think this could be a game that they – I I would be very <laughs> nervous about how it goes. They could be trying some wide zone stuff. They've done that other times this year. Um, but definitely some tight zone and duo because they'll run those into any front. Those are kind of like run it runs where you you get that play call and sometimes you get a call that's like against even do this, odd do this. You get that call and it's just like that's your run call. Like don't worry about anything else. It'll work against either one. At least it does on paper. So that's what I'm uh, thinking. Unless I'm at the other way around, in which case uh, Kyle Shanahan will run absolutely everything. Yeah. Kyle versus Lou. We'll see what it looks like. And honestly, one of my favorite Joe Burrow games was the 49ers loss. Um, the fourth quarter, letting Joe cook. It was like when they finally let Joe cook, but didn't let him cook in overtime. And I know Zach Taylor, you know, he was raising his hand at the end of it. It was like, I should have let Joe Throw the ball in overtime. He was able to throw two great touchdown passes to Jamar Chase after they struggled. They pretty much gave the ball away on two special teams. Um, uh, who was it? Who was it? I'm losing my train of thought. Fumbled the ball. Darius Phillips. Darius Phillips. And pretty much let the 49ers in the game. And it just felt like, oh, it's so sloppy. They're not going to come back. They ended up coming back. And, again, that was my favorite Joe Burrow game. One of my favorite Joe Burrow games, um, even though it was a loss. Because then you, you just saw how special he was in that game. Um, in the second half. So yeah, we'll see. We'll see Kyle versus Lou. Um, right now, Christian McCaffrey, again, we will have a podcast all next week to preview all of this. Um, he's currently day to day. So um, I would, I would be surprised if he doesn't play in the Bengals game. They do have a game on Monday night football, be a short week for them. And then Debo is expected to return to both left the Browns game early and obviously huge playmakers for the 49ers offense. So we'll go ahead and get to that next question. What happened? We talked about this and I apologize in advance because here's the thing. I send these Twitter questions to our producer, Spencer, and we hit on it. And, and, I'm, and I'm sorry about that, but let's just hit on a little more when it comes to the, the running game and, and, and what that's you're expecting that to look like in the second half of the season. And we don't even have to say if Joe Mixon gets injured, but just overall. Yeah. Um, I guess they just split everything and maybe that's how you could see, no, well, they probably just active or, raise up no because they have four running backs so i feel like they just go into the game with three running backs use travion chase and chris and try to get through a game but that's where i'd be worried because I, I don't think they trust them and is there you no know, that i guess would be the ultimate test of is it right or wrong that they don't trust them because they're gonna have to see work i mean they'll have to run the ball at least a little bit and they haven't been trusted to do that at all this year. So that's the main one where I think of when I'm thinking of like why you should add another running back is just mixing and all running backs typically miss a game or two. Yep. What happens during those games? Cause imagine that happens in a very winnable game and then you get up four points or something and you want to run four minute drill, you know, where you just kill the clock and run it out and Joe Mixon's not there. Who do you go to? That would be tough. They they needed one yard on Sunday. And he didn't get it. But, uh, that was also a terrible front to run into. And the Seahawks, credit to him, they ran a stunt and blitzed the linebacker. I couldn't tell if it was a blitz or he just reacted that quickly. But it was there to open him up and get him a free shot one-on-one -on -one with the running back. So credit to them for getting that play in there. But on the other side, Mixon one on one with the running back to gain one yard. I feel like you got to get it. You have to get it. Um, and then I will say this this is my hot take. We'll stay with the running back room right now. My hot take is we will see more Chase Brown. He's not going to overtake Joe Mixon's snaps or anything like that, but we will see Chase Brown as early as more Chase Brown because we'd saw him in the past game. The next game, there will be a Chase Brown touchdown. Wow. 
I'm just going to say last week I called the Tyler Boyd touchdown and I said Yoshi was going to score next. Two of those things happened. I feel like it's just going to be one of those situations and they're on the 10 yard line. Chase Brown runs it in, maybe even eight yard line. And they give it to Chase Brown. I'll be honest with you. I, I don't really see this happening unless there's a mix and injury. <laughs> No, no, no. I don't want I don't want Joe Mixon to be injured. I think they're gonna change it up. They're gonna put Chase Brown in there. Be like, Chase, we need you to run six, seven yards to the end zone against this defense. Yeah, it's the 49ers part of it yep. too that's getting me. You know what? Get back game for the 49ers this weekend against the Vikings. Thank goodness they're playing a team before they play Cincinnati. And um, it's on the road. Crazy things happen in the NFL. And that is my hot take that we will see more Chase Brown in this 49ers game. Not only will we see him. He'll score a touchdown. All right. That's, where I'm, I'm sure. That's where I'm at. I don't know. Maybe I need some optimism when it comes to the running back room right now. And this is not to be like down on Joe Mixon. I always feel like I have a disclaimer for that. But um, it's just I'm I'm concerned of of who RB2 is. And, and maybe they, they have the guy in the room because I don't see them trading for one. We'll get to another Twitter question. What changes could happen over bye weekend? You could say this on the defensive side. I know we've focused a lot on the offense, too. Yeah, guys get healthy. Uh, I think the offense where I think of it more is where you can implement a little bit more stuff. Both the offense and the defense will probably self-scout and see like, okay, what's going well, what's not going well. It could be something as simple as, you know, well, we're actually really effective when we get into split back and run out of it instead of pass. So maybe we'll just add a little bit more of that in there. Or maybe it's that our split back stuff is garbage. Let's kind of toss that out and stop wasting plays. Um, I, that's Those are examples. Those aren't things I'm thinking. That's why I kind of went with the same exact thing and flipped both sides of it. But that's what they'll do is they'll try to figure out what's working, what's not working, what they can tweak, wrinkle to throw in there, some tendency breakers that maybe they haven't put together yet. The bye week is definitely a bye week for the players, but it doesn't – I feel like it's not as much of a bye week for the coaches who are probably – watching a lot of stuff, coming up with a lot of stuff. Um, and on defense, same thing, but just, you know, what are we most effective in playing coverage and what, you know, like where could we get more opportunities for certain players or, you know, like Miles Murphy, for example, can we get him on the field a little bit more? Can we figure out how to get that to work or, uh, you know, maybe we should add more stunts because BJ Hill's doing a really good job on them right now. Uh yeah, just random ideas in there. I think one of the coaches, and I can't remember if it was Lou or Brian Callahan, because I feel like I've listened to so many coach coach interviews over the last few days, said that they were going to go away for two days and then they were coming back. <laughs> and it's all <laughs> like that's how quick their buy is because some of the players they don't have to be back till Monday. So the other coaches are like, "I'll be gone for two days. I got to get back. We have some game planning to do." Um, as they they get ready for the 49ers. I, I think. I know, you know, it's it's been mentioned, but I think we will see kind of that transition of more Jordan battle. I just don't know if it's going to be against the 49ers or it's against the Bills. But I just feel like that transition is, even though the percentage-wise from this past game wasn't there, just, I don't know, it just feels like it's it's going to happen sooner than it later. It feels like it's going to happen to me because of how they're now using Dax Hill, where they were using – uh, Jordan bat or they were using Dax Hill mostly underneath and Nick Scott deep. And they mm -hmm. kind of flipped that the past two weeks where they're using Dax Hill more deep and um, Nick Scott underneath. And if that's going to be the role of the safeties, they play a lot too high too. So mm -hmm. you just have to trust that safeties can take half the field or quarter of the field. But if that's going to be the switch in single high, then that does fit what Jordan Battle does. And if that's how they want to use Dax Hill, if that's how they see his usage in the future, maybe that's how they see they have to use him with Jordan Battle, I don't know. But that's kind of uh, what's indicating to me the light bulb was kind of going off in my head of like, oh, the writing may be on the wall, even though they're not really using uh, Jordan Battle too much this week. Do you like that? Um, yeah, because I feel like you have to get there eventually. Nick Scott's missing too many tackles. It's my biggest issue. I don't think he's doing – I don't think he's that much of a liability. I don't really think he's some liability that you put under a microscope and can really kill. Um, I think he's more of like, ah, he didn't make a play there, or he's in the right spot a lot of the times, or he actually does something that's somewhat impressive once in a while. But it's just – 
He does take okay angles for the most part, but he missed one <laughs> this past game. And he's missed tackles. It's the tackles. He's missed so many tackles. And then I heard the broadcast talk about it. So they're everywhere. It, it, he's just not been consistent enough. Um, and a lot of that to me is his ability to tackle. And now that he's in the box all the time, he's not doing a fantastic job there. But I also didn't think that's where they would be using him. So it wasn't his strong suit in the first place, which is also like light bulb. You know, that's Jordan Battle fits there, but maybe Nick Scott doesn't. Yeah, we'll see what happens there. One final question in the Twitter mailbag. You mentioned Miles Murphy. Maybe we'll see Miles more Miles Murphy out there. We've talked about it. Three would be good for his rookie year. Mm -hmm. He already has one. What are the chances Miles Murphy gets six sacks? This year? This year. Pretty low. Yeah, because they have the pressure all on their D-line right now. They're getting to the quarterback. They have are the we, guys to get to the quarterback. We're late in this podcast. People have stopped listening. Are yeah. we able to talk about how Miles Murphy's been a more effective pass rusher than Joseph Osai so far this year? Or Whoa. I, I go, go on. I mean, I just don't – Joseph Osai hasn't done anything, and I don't want to say it's all that. He was my breakout player. I have a lot of faith that he is a good player, mm -hmm. but – it's just funny to me seeing like 30 snaps for Osai and he doesn't do a single thing. And then one snap for Murphy. I feel like if Osai doesn't do anything in 15 snaps, maybe just start throwing some of those Murphys away and see if his get off speed and power can get him to the quarterback instead. Um, but I don't know. I think Sam Hubbard should play less snaps than they played last week. But mm -hmm. like I said last week as well, or on the podcast last time was he was, he, I mean, he was, uh, his fastball was at was clocking in at like 103. You know, he, he was throwing gas. He was killing the offensive tackle across from him, so it's hard to pull him out of that game. Um, I I personally want to see more Murphy snaps. Mm -hmm. I just – it feels like they can't – they didn't find a way to fit him in against Seattle, and he's going to need those game reps to get better, to evolve as a player. Um He's only rushed the passer 34 times, I believe I saw. Because they drop him into coverage a lot, too, for some reason. I think he probably has like five coverage snaps, 34 pass rush snaps, and then some run snaps. And 34, he has three pressures on a sack. To me, ramp it up. Ramp it up. Let's see. Let's see if he keeps that pace, which is like an okay pace. But that's exactly what we were kind of expecting. Like, he'll be okay this year. Um, but yeah, I, I don't know. Like he's been probably more effective than Joseph Osai so far this season as a pass rusher. That's what bums me out because I was looking forward to Joseph Osai too. And look, I, somebody, he could still be battling his injury and kind of playing through it. You know, we'll never know because players do but that. But if that is the case, then. Miles Murphy should be playing. Yeah, exactly. Here's another thing with, with Joseph Osai. He's going to play out his rookie contract and that's probably going to be in Cincinnati. Because yeah, I mean, the, his the agent is well. Oh, is he a Malagetta guy? He's a Malagetta guy. Okay. So he's going to be here as long as his rookie contract, and I don't see it being any longer. And that is that's unfortunate because I really like Joseph Asai. If the last thing didn't happen in the AFC Championship game, and I'll never blame him for that, but he played his face off in the AFC Championship game, and I think a lot of people forget that and what he can do on the defensive side of the ball. But I agree with you. If mile if if. Joseph, Joseph Asai isn't 100% from an injury or, or whatever's going on there. Rotate Miles Murphy in. Let's see what you have in Miles Murphy. Get get some more chances. So maybe we'll see that towards the second half of the season. Yeah, that was even supposed to be like um, not just like uh, Miles Murphy is better than Joseph Asai. No. That was supposed to be like Joseph Asai, if he's, you know, like performing at this level, you might as well just toss Murphy in there for now and give Asai more breaks and – let his yeah. ankle heal up even more. I know it's high ankle sprain, so it's hard to tell when that gets better. And he tries, I'm sure, to come back as quickly as possible. But yeah, Miles Murphy six sacks probably not happening this year. Uh, no. Does that mean he's a bust? Also, no. I mean, the trajectory in my mind for him is something along the lines of three ish sacks this season. Mm -hmm. And he has to be able to rush the passer to do that. It's not on him that he gets one snap. I mean, maybe it is somehow practice, whatever. But to me. If he's not getting the opportunity, how's he supposed to show what he can do? So I'm hoping for like three sacks this year. 
And then it could be year two breakout, could be year three breakout, but that's what you're hoping for is year two, year three is he explodes. And I'm guessing more likely year three for the Bengals just because it'll be Hendrickson and Hubbard again next year. Mm -hmm. um, but Joseph Osayu, he had three and a half sacks last year, and we were all pretty excited about those three and a half mm -hmm. sacks. So if Murphy gets three sacks this year and then next year, if you can bump that up four in a limited role, five in a limited role, but like you start thinking, okay, like I know he's a part-time player, but he looks like he's got the goods. And then he goes to a full-time starter year three, and maybe then you can get the full experience. You know, if you do, if you put it out at the end of the season, if Miles Murphy gets three and a half sacks and people are like, that's not good enough, that's not enough. And you say, were you happy with Joseph Asai's production last year? And they say, yeah, it was. Thought I did a good job. Yeah, and you right. give them those two numbers. It, it'll be looked at totally different ways. And I know it's different because Miles Murphy was a first round pick, but he was a late first round pick. And mm -hmm. I don't, I don't know. I'm 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 still on this. Miles Murphy is going to be really fun, and I can't wait to see what he's going to be able to do. But I agree with you. Let's see what let's see, let's see some more Miles Murphy out there. And that is nothing against Joseph Aside because look, I want Joseph Aside to be amazing on this defense. Um, and it just just hasn't been there yet. So we'll see. We'll see what that looks like. But um, overall, everybody knows what they did against Seattle, and it was really encouraging. You have a great piece on all Bengals. Uh, just give a quick uh, summary of what's up there. Uh, well, the thing that stood out to me in the past game was when the Bengals had back-to-back -back goal line stands and gave up zero points. So I wrote about that. They had negative five net yards over those two stands. Uh, credit to the sacks. But – yeah, but Geno Smith, one of five passing the ball, and that's when he got the ball off because he got sacked twice as well. So seven pass attempts and six of them failed, and then there's a run play that also failed, and that was almost all exclusively DJ Reader uh, just dominating. So And Logan Wilson making a good run in and finishing it off. But, yeah, that, like, read about it because there's some guys that stepped up. There's a reason that the Bengals defense played so well in that stretch and you could see every play I went over every play. So you could see every play and think like, was this good defense or was this, uh, you know, Seattle messing up or Gino not seeing it or whatever to me, all of them good defense, except the one play that they gained 12 yards, in which case that wasn't good defense, but they made the stop and then played good defense after that. So one out of eight plays didn't go well and seven of them did. And that's how you end up giving up zero points on two goal line stands. The way the first drive happened, I thought it was going to be a long day at Paycor. So for them to – for it to end the way it did, um, just a great job by the defensive side of the ball. really felt a lot like 2021, 2022, when they've had to step up when the offense was struggling um, in the second half. But make sure you go check that out during bye weekend. All Bengals, follow along, Bengals underscore Sand. You can follow me at LNDS Patterson. And thank you for listening, too. It's always game day in Cincinnati.